psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times. You are welcome to the house of God. Father God, we welcome you and ask the Holy Spirit to touch each of us to heal healing presence with you with us, that you save us, that you mature us in the things of God, that we will walk by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We all have something on our hearts that we're interceding for God to take care of. Amen. Amen. Guess what? He's already made a way.
apologize for a second. Lord, we love you because of your great love for us. We love you. We know that we can never comprehend fully, but what we do understand is marvelous. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your great love for us.
here right now. I sense his presence. There's a spirit in my soul. There's a spirit in all of my souls. That means his spirit is touching us. And if you prepare for the sacrament of Holy Communion, God wants to do a special work in all of our hearts. All of our minds. God says he wants to heal you. As we look at the scripture today, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord, but I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread and gave given thanks. He said, He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in return to me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it. So in a few minutes, we're going to take the bread. We're going to eat of this bread. In a few minutes, we're going to take the cup. We're going to drink of the cup. And remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, this is my body. He took this bread. When he was with his disciples, he broke it. He said, take eat. This is my body. Then Jesus does something very, very interesting. He takes the cup. And he passes the cup. And he tells them to drink out of this cup. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And he tells us in the passage of 1 Corinthians to examine ourselves and don't eat of this cup. Don't eat of this bread and drink of this cup in an unworthy manner. So in a few minutes, I'm going to allow you to examine yourselves. That means you're going to pray and ask God to forgive you and sin that you commit. Don't want to wait sometimes when we get out of sin and we say and do things that come on now. So we need to ask for forgiveness as a church. We can also pray for the forgiveness of our nation and for the people that live in our land. That God will forgive them of their sins. But as I was meditating on the scripture, I was just really taking it back that Jesus used the bread and the wine to connect with his body and his blood. The bread and the wine connects with his body and his blood. What's the significance of that? Why is he saying that? Why did he use the word, the bread? Why did he use the cup and connect it with his body and connect it with his blood? So I was reading in an earlier passage of John. And in this passage, it precedes a miracle that Jesus did where he was feeding 5,000 people out of five loaves and two, uh, two pieces of fish. He fed 5,000 people by breaking it as he passed it and he's broken it. He multiplied and did a miracle. And the people were all amazed. And so because Jesus did this miracle, the people started to follow Jesus. Because they might have made a free meal. This is the river. They were following Jesus. They were going to go back and get some free food. So they were following Jesus. So Jesus kind of said, You're coming after me. And I cut another day or so went by. And he said, You're coming after me because I fed you with food. And I fed you with bellies. He says, But if you really want to come after me, of my flesh and you must drink my blood. And they said, whoa, 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 what is he talking about? Eat my flesh and drink my blood? And the story picks up in John chapter 6 verse 53. Then Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise them up in the last day. So Jesus still doesn't explain what he means by this eating of the flesh. He goes on and says these words. For my flesh is real food. And my blood is real to drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Wait a minute, Pastor David. Is he talking about cannibalism? No, keep reading, we'll find out. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my flesh, blood remains in me and I am dead. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors and your ancestors ate manna, manna's bread, ate manna and died. But whoever 
feeds on this bread will live forever. What he was talking about was taking in his words, taking in the things that he said, and living by them. When Jesus says, don't hate your brother or sister, that's feeding on his flesh. When Jesus says, make reconciliation with your brother and sister, when they harm you and forgive them, that's drinking his blood. Jesus said, whoever will come after you must deny himself and follow him. So you and I have to get to the place this morning as we enter into this community and we get ready to eat this bread and drink this blood. You are saying that you identify with all that Jesus said and stood for. And two of the key things he said and stood for was to love God and love the Father and to love you. So if you're taking communion this morning, the sacrament of communion, you got to lay it down and say, I'm going to identify with Jesus. I'm going to love you with all my heart. What does that mean? We're working that out as a church. Because we're talking about what it means to mature in Christ. Mature in things about the next several months. So what does that mean? We say we're supposed to love our neighbor. And in our neighbors that are suffering, even in this church and our brother, we care about them. And we're going to do everything in our power. Say amen to that. Now, John chapter 3. And verse 22. Let's turn our Bible to John chapter 3. It's on the overhead here in front of me. And let's stand for the reading of God's word. John chapter 3. And verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out to the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Nea near Salim, because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples, a certain Jew over the man of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this John replied, a person can only receive what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but am said ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater, and I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and what he has heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, we ask that you bless this word to our hearts. May we walk in the light of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In your bulletins, please pull them out. There's an outline there. There's, there's four things that I want to share with you in this brief amount of time. There's four things that I want to share with you. So, number one, the first thing is, right in, spend time with Jesus. Spend time with Jesus and take time right in to be with other believers. So I thought this morning, our theme this morning is what does it mean to be a true follower of Jesus Christ? This is so beautiful because I've actually followed the ministry of Virginia Phillips over the years. She's been a woman that has totally, in addition to church, she has totally been someone that I have leaned toward, relied on for counsel, She's spoken into my life, spoken into uh, Trisha's life over the years, and she's someone that's been a blessing to me. I remember this one time as an example when I'm talking about Virginia convened a conference, and it was a conference uh, up in uh, Silverton, and it was a Women of Purpose conference, and there were women and men there gathering, and we were just basically lo loving on the Lord and worshiping God. And I felt led in the spirit of that conference, I was kind of co-leading with Virginia 
tax regime, and there were men and women, they would split the men up and split the women up, and they were separate groups. And I asked Virginia to come and speak to the men's group. And we actually have had Virginia come and speak to our men's breakfast here and meet some Saturday mornings. Well, on that occasion, happened to be a Saturday morning in Silverton at the Christian Conference Center. I asked Virginia to come and speak to a group of about 20 men. And it was just something beautiful that happened. Talk about being a follower of Jesus and spending time with Jesus. Because she had been such a good example at this point, number one. Virginia came to us men who would sit in a circle, and she spoke words of life and healing. And in men, sometimes we as men, we go through problems, and we have issues growing up, and maybe we have issues with women, or we have issues with other men. And Virginia, in a gentle, sensitive, healing way, put her hand on each of our shoulders, and walked around the group, and spoke a word from heaven into our lives. That word was tremendous. And when she came to me, she spoke to me. And she deposited love in my heart. Yeah. I'm convinced there was no way that would have ever been pulled off. Because not only me, but many of the men around the circle that day were crying and weeping and got in what I call a spiritual breakthrough because Virginia spent time with God. Amen. When I call Virginia sometimes, she says, all I got up in the middle of the night, I was praying. And she's a woman that spends time with God, and because of that, it affects her ministry and ability to be able to communicate to people, and to love people, and to care for people. And you're going to hear from her in a few minutes. A woman who spends time with God, and if you and I would take the time to emulate Virginia and do like she does and spend time, you too will be able to speak to people when they're in the <coughs> needful times of their lives and speak a word from heaven and it will bless them. Thank you, Brother Chris. It will bless them and it will heal them and it will change their lives. So spend time with God. What does it mean to spend time with God? That's how we mature. One of the things that we decided as a church is we're going to embrace two priorities this year. Our vision and our mission is to do two, big, two major things. One, we're going to go fishing, number one. Number two, we're going to mature the things of God. Now, when we say go fishing, some of you like to go out to the Columbia River, or some of you like to go out to your favorite home and fish, and that's good. But we're talking about sharing Christ's love with other people. That's what we mean by go fishing. And in order to do that, we have to mature the things of God. Because if we try to just do it on our own, and our own flesh and strength will fail at it. But as we mature in the things of God, it will give us the ability to go fishing. The two, the two, the two mandate or dual goals for this year are dependent on each other. You can't go fishing unless you walk on the road and mature. You can't be mature in Christ unless you go fishing. And in the history of the Christian church, we've seen extremes. The church has been very good about reading this book. The church has been very good about maturing. The church has been very good about Bible studies in small groups and really getting into the scriptures. And we've gotten into prophecy. And we've gotten into end time theology that's called eschatology. And we've gotten into our hermeneutics. Hermeneutics means how to interpret scripture from a biblical standpoint and do good exegesis, which means to grab out of the text and see what it's really saying. And in the history of the church, we've got a real strong and our uh, terminal degrees, meaning your know, PhDs and your know, super doctorates. And we've got a good at that. We have seminary schools all around the nation where men and women go to school for three years and they gain an advanced degree. And I'm in the seminary. And we've got a real good about that. But at the time that we've been just enmeshing ourselves in studying the scriptures. As a church, at the time that we've been so good about having our small group times and building ourselves up, up and making our churches really be good inside, we've neglected people who are perishing on the outside and lost for eternity. And that's been the history of the church at times. And there have been times in the history of the church where we wanted to go out and we wanted to save everybody. We wanted to care about, about everybody. But we weren't mature. We weren't walking in the Spirit. And so we went out and told somebody about Jesus. And then we were hating on them and calling and living ungodly lives and doing racist acts and doing acts that are ungodly against people that are not Christian, and people that are not about faith, people that are other belief systems and people other lifestyle choice systems. We look at them and say, you're going to hell. And we're doing it in the name of going fishing. That's been a mockery against the church. 
And so that's why we have to have a balance of both. We have to go fishing, but we have to mature. When I go to someone to share Jesus with them, the first thing that I'm about to have to be, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus Christ, are you going to heaven? No. First thing I'm about to say, are you hungry? Can I feed you? First thing I'm about to say, what's going on with your life? We got to do both. And it happens by spending time with God. This woman that right here in the struggle is my wife. And her name is Patricia Ann Randolph Greenwich. Randolph is her main name. And I've lived with her for 34 years. Did I get that right? 34 years. I was with another occasion about a week ago. And I still thought I would say 34. She said 34. <laughs> so I'm going to make sure I got around 34. And I've been with her for 34 years. And she looks a certain way. I know what she's feeling. Shouldn't have said a word. I said, what's going on? And I said, you ain't feeling well. She goes, no, I'm not. When I come in the door, she has been going out of house. Before I say something, I said, ooh, you got some, you got some illusion with you. And she tells me. And one of the things she told me a week ago was, there's a mouse in the garage and it's your tent. So I open the garage the mouse. It was dead. It was in the couch. And I had to put it in the garage again. And I stay at work because I know her. If I didn't spend time with her in quality ways, I would not know this woman. Even though I lived with her for 34 years, if I did not spend time with her, really learning her, I wouldn't know her. Sentence of our You and I don't want to get to heaven and stand face to face with the King of the Universe and never took the time to know him. Can you imagine that getting to heaven and meeting Jesus? And Jesus looks at you and goes, I don't know you. And that's what the Word of God says for some people. That's going to be their life. Jesus is going to say, Depart from me, you work. Now, I'm most of you here this morning, super job, just because I know most of you. Oh, I know it in, and you're going to make it in him. I believe that with all my heart. I've seen that from your life. But there's some of you here this morning that haven't been spending time with your Lord and Savior. Don't get out of your bed. Don't leave your house. Don't go to bed at night without acknowledging your Savior and mentioning his name. Say amen to that. Yeah. Wake up in the morning and say, Jesus, I thank you for a good night's sleep. I thank you that I was under your protection. I thank you that I didn't get hit when you drive down the street. The scripture says that that's the moment to pray with my sister. You had that all going down in conversation with the Lord and you spent time with him. You're going to be torn things about. Let the church say amen. amen. So that's point number one. Now notice it says in verse 22, John 3 22, it says, After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent time with them. So I'm encouraging you to spend time with Jesus. You need to spend time with each other because Jesus is also wanting to spend time with you. It's reciprocal. When you spend time with Jesus, he spends time with you. And here he took his disciples together after he fed the 5,000, after he talked to the ministry, after he talked to Nicodemus and told Nicodemus in chapter 3 what it means to be born of the water and the spirit. He spent time with them. When you spend time with Jesus, you will understand that he loves you. Notice the other thing in verse 22 it says, He spent time with them. And it says, And baptized. So here's the dual thing that I said is, that has reciprocity. You need to spend time with the Lord. You need to mature, but you also need to go fishing. Jesus spent time with his disciples, and then what does it say he did? And he baptized. When he went and baptized other people, he brought them into the kingdom of God. See how Jesus did both things too? So our mission statement of the church that we Decide as a leadership team to embrace is very biblical. Jesus here did it himself. You always have to think about the other person. You always have to think about the person that doesn't have a mindset of God's consciousness in their hearts. It says Jesus baptized. Point number two, right in 
He increases and we decrease. Rather, He increases and we decrease. Look at verse 30. He must become greater and I must become less. This is the second key <clears throat> for us to mature in the things of God. We yield our dreams and our passions to the Lord God. Then He uses us to embrace His power. Going efficient and mature. We will see other dreams and passions because in our lives, as we fulfill His, and ours will be fulfilled. We will have joy and purpose in our lives because we embrace His. If we're willing to let our agenda be second to Jesus' agenda, we'll be blessed. When I was a young man growing up in New York City, we had just moved to Seattle, Washington. I had a dream at one point because I won an oratory contest at Cleveland High School up in Seattle, Washington, and I won the citywide oratory contest. That's the way they get students from all high schools, and they basically have a speech run off to see who's one of the best speakers in town. And so I was fortunate enough to win that contest, and my name was in the school newspaper, and they had a real small uh, PR thing in Seattle Times. I won it. And all of a sudden, at that moment, here I am, a 16 year old student in high school, I had a dream that I wanted to be president of the United States. <laughs> that was my dream, okay? And fast forward, 15 years ahead of that, I started working in the corporate world. I was working for an insurance company, I was an underwriter. And then after that, I became a manager. And then after that, I became a general manager, which is where I had 100 people that were in my department. And then after that, I became a vice president of marketing. And at that point, I had a dream that I was going to be a president of a big insurance company. And that was my dream. And Timothy and Michael and Kim, my three sons, says, Yeah, Dad, go, Dad, go, Dad. We love that dream because you get bonuses. Yeah, Dad, you go. <laughs> Matter of fact, Timothy was born my son. He said to me, The day I left the insurance field, he said, what kind of income are you going to be getting to go work for this nonprofit? We like our lifestyle guys. So that was my dream. I want to be president of an insurance company. But oh, along the way, I fell in love with Jesus. And I started realizing that rather than being the president of a company or president of the United States, there was a greater mission that God had called me to. And I started seeing, just like my dad got his vision, he grew up in New York and God gave him a vision of all souls. He gave me the same vision and I realized that a greater vision than that would be a part of leading people to Jesus Christ. And the ministry opportunities came forward and I started going to seminary. And here I am as a pastor. Say amen. amen. So when you decide that you want to put your dreams and your passions secondary to God, God will bless you. Let the church say amen. amen. Point number three. Break this down. And Virginia, get ready to come up in five minutes. Jesus Christ is Lord in every area of our lives. Point number three. Jesus, is that what we have? Oh, I'm sorry. We must recognize, there it is, thank you. We must recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord in every area of our lives. This means that we understand that He controls and has purpose and meaning to everything that happens in our lives. We must trust Him in all the hard areas of our lives. We must talk to Him. We must gather with other believers and work for our family, work out our own soul salvation. That's verse 31. We must recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord in every area of your life. Carol Johnson, my dear sister Carol Johnson, she was a person that was in a wheelchair. She went home to be with the Lord. She died. She passed away about a month ago. And Carol Johnson is a good example of allowing Jesus Christ to be Lord in every area of her life. Carol Johnson started out as a woman who was born and raised in Oregon, who left the left of normal life, uh, got married, had kids had two sons and everything was going fine in Carol's life. Carol Johnson then picked up from a diagnosis from a doctor, MS, and the disease started to debilitate her. And 
slowly but surely a player in a wheelchair. And his vibrant Sunday school teacher, she used to be a member of the Amendo Covenant Church. Everybody loved her. Her husband, everybody went from this vibrant, active person to a person that was reduced to a wheelchair. From there, she ended up getting a divorce. From there, she ended up being moved into a senior service living center. Alone, remember. And that's when David Kane's entire recovery church steps in. We start going to a ministry where she lived at, and we did Bible studies, and that ministry still goes on today. And some of the conversations that we ever had on, right before she died and in the years leading up to her death, she had almost several close calls. But she said, you know what, David? I can remember, that's the day, how vibrant I was, how active I was, and now I've had this disease. And it's taken my ability to walk every morning. And she goes, but I still want to serve God. Even though I should be mad, I should be mad at my husband, I've forgiven him. And she goes, I'm going to love people, and I'm going to use my disability to love people. So you know what Carol did? Carol decided to make pictures. And she put these beautiful flowers in picture frames and made these beautiful markers, bookmarkers. And she passed it out to us in this church and to many people in her senior center. That was a stimulus to tell people about Jesus and leave many people in that nursing home over the last 10 to 12 years that came to know Jesus because of her witness and her participation in that Bible study until I decided to let Jesus be the Lord, even though she had a bad thing that happened to her. Point number four, there is only one God, and Jesus is the way to that God. So we must recognize that Jesus is truthful. We must recognize that Jesus is truthful. 